So we'll do like a half an hour presentation now on um, CRISPR-Cas based screens and then we'll have again like 20 to 30 minutes depending on how many questions of just a Q&A session and then we'll move to the third module so there won't be another really long break like this one was. Um, okay, so I will introduce our next speaker who is Julia. She's a student in the Zhang lab and she will talk to us about screens and after she's going to talk, um, we have a guest, an honorary member, Charlie, who is from the Lander Lab. Um, and he will also talk about some of his recent work screen with screens. Okay. Hello. Hi, so today I'd like to talk about um, genome scale CRISPR-Cas9 engineering. And four genetic screens are extremely powerful tools because they enable us to map specific genetic perturbations to phenotype. As shown here, traditionally, um, we would um, chemically induce um, mutations in flies and then um, figure out which flies had the interesting mutations and then go back and try to figure out which mutations there were. This um, was induced to um, achieve that phenotype. Um, this kind of um, chemical mutagenesis screening is very difficult, can be very difficult to identify the um, specific mutation that resulted in the phenotype of interest. And recently, with um, the advent of um, shRNA and CRISPR-Cas9 development, um, the process of uh, forward genetic screens has become a lot easier. Um, just a brief overview of shRNAs. Um, shRNAs require a delivery of a, sh a short hairpin RNA that then gets um, through Drosha processing in the nucleus and Dicer processing in the cytoplasm, um, results in an siRNA that um, in complex with the risk complex um, will uh, result in mRNA degradation and translational inhibition. And this is often used to do knockdown screening. Um, for CRISPR-Cas9 knockout, um, the Cas9 enzyme can bind to a specific target sequence in the genome um, based on the sequence complementary base, base pairing of the um, target sequence in the sgRNA. And once the Cas9 is guided to a specific place in the genome, it will induce a double-stranded break that results uh, mostly through an NHEJ mediated mutation, a, an indel that um, will cause a frame, frame shift in the protein coding sequence. Uh, resulting in a pre premature stop codon and depletion of the functional protein as well as um, nonsense media decay of the mRNA. And more recently, the dead Cas9 activation path um, has been very useful for overexpressing genes of interest. And this is another way of perturbation called gain of function screening. And um, the way this works is that the Cas9 nuclease is rendered uh, inactive by two, two mutations uh, resulting in a dead Cas9. And when we um, fuse this with a VP64 activation domain and then subsequently recruit two additional um, activation domains, P65 and HSF1, using the, by engineering the guide RNA hairpins, um, we get a complex that has three different activation domains, and this can result in a very robust transcriptional upregulation, and um, this is used for overexpression screening. Now, the, the CRISPR-Cas9 screening, because it's so easy to generate a pool of different oligos for um, either shRNA or CRISPR-Cas9, um, it has been applied for many, many different applications to understand complex uh, biological processes, such as shown here, the pathways involved in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so for example, it has been used for drug toxin resistance, gene essentiality, the hypoxia response, viral host factors, bacterial lipopolysaccharide response, metastasis, even for recently for non-coding elements. And basically, um, the CRISPR-Cas9 screening system can be applied to any biological process with a screenable phenotype. What does this mean? Um, so there are three different types of screening. Um, the first is a positive selection, then negative selection, and marker gene selection. What this means is that when we introduce a pool of different mutations in, into a population of cells, if the one in blue confers the screening phenotype in a positive selection screen, the any cell with a mutation with the blue, the change in blue, um, will grow faster. And so as a result, at the end of the screen, the um, cells with the screening phenotype will be more enriched. And this is a, a positive selection screen. 
a negative selection screen is the opposite of that, where the ones in blue will um, have a disadvantage at pro proliferating and will usually die off. And so at the end, you will not find any, any cells with the mutation you're looking for, uh, with the screening phenotype. And, and the marker gene selection is where um, you most of the time you engineer the um, gene that you're interested in to be fluorescent upon activation. So at the end of the screen, um, the cells with the phenotype that you want are, um, will be green and you can select out those cells with fast sorting. And um, typically for marker gene selection, we do not do um, genome scale screens because it's very, because of the cells that are required, it's very difficult to sort through um, several hundred million cells that are required for screening. And so, um, just briefly going through the um, timeline of CRISPR-Cas9 knockout and um, activation screening, we've recently put together in Nature Protocols for um, how to perform a CRISPR-Cas9 um, knockout and activation screening. The first version of this protocol is available on BioArchive, so all the details about, uh, and about how to perform certain parts of the, um, of the screen, as well as any Python scripts that are necessary to analyze um, the, sc the screen or validate the screen are available online. So today I'm going to go over more of the um, high level experimental design parts of um, setting up a screen. So um, just a general overview, starting off with, um, starting off, um, there's several different options for library construction. Um, and once you've selected a library that you want to screen with, um, you produce lentivirus at a very high, uh, very large scale, transduce the lentivirus into a pool of cells to such that each cell has a different genetic perturbation, and isolate the gDNA um, at the end of the screening selection, then PCR out, PCR amplify all the um, all the sgRNAs from this pool of genomic DNA, and from, from sequencing results of those um, PCR amplicons, you can um, analyze it to obtain a set of candidate genes that are involved in your um, screen. And then finally, uh, because this is a ranked list of candidate genes, we want to validate the, um, the candidate genes to see whether or not they are truly involved in the screen phenotype but, and do a Western blot to make sure that the, um, the target gene was knocked down or activated. Uh, and for knockout specifically, we will PCR out for indel analysis and for activation, we will do qPCR to verify um, gene upregulation. So today I'm going to focus mostly on knockout and activation screening because there, there are two different modes of screening and that, um, for the other types of screening, like um, CRISPR-I, um, so fusing a dead Cas9 to a crab for gene knockdown, um, that is this type of protocol can be easily translated to um, other types of screens. So starting off with the library construction, um, the we have provided several different libraries on adgene, um, the first of which is a genome scale knockout library targeting either the human or the mouse genome. This library is uh, called the Gecko. Um, it is available in a web vector system where the SPCAS9 and the guide are on the same vector, or in a dual vector system where the Cas9 and the guide are on two separate vectors. Um, as well as an activation library that also targets the human and mouse genomes. Um, this, is, uh, this is designed for the SAM system, so um, the, the activation system with the three different activation domains recruited by the guide RNA. Um, this particular system also targets the human and mouse and targets the 200 base pairs upstream of each promoter, each transcriptional start site in RefSeq. And this system is available in the two vector system as well as a three vector system with different, um, different selection markers for the guide RNA. Now, there are times when we want to design a custom targeted library, and what a targeted library is, is you isolate the, a subset of sgRNAs from a larger pool of guides, typically from a genome scale, um, genome scale screen. And the reason why we want to do this is because um, for genome scale screens, there's uh, usually a very high, 
very large number of cells involved, and I'll go through the calculations of how many cells exactly are involved uh, in later slides. But um, so to do a target screen, the reasoning is that you want to reduce the number of cells that are required in your screen. And, or in some other cases, you are only concerned with a subset of genes, so you only want to screen those. For example, if you only want membrane proteins, et cetera. Um, so that's when we want to do a target screen. Um, so for custom library design, we also provide scripts for doing this. Um, it's not on BioArchive, but it's in the second version of the protocol. So email me if you're interested in this. But what this custom library design script does is that it, um, you feed it a list of genomic interest regions that you're interested in targeting, and um, it will identify all possible guides in that region, and, and then figure out the off-target scores for each of them. Um, and then um, filter out guides that have homopolymers or um, low GC content, and then um, select a set, a specified number of guides per target. And then you can also add additional non targeting guides into your screening pool. The non targeting guides are very important as a control for your screen, especially if you haven't done the specific type of screen before, because it helps you decide whether or not the sgRNA enrichment at the end of the screen is due to noise because the non targeting guys should theoretically should not be enriched. Okay. Okay. So we also provide a protocol for custom library cloning. Briefly, um, you synthesize the oligos as a pool um, using either custom array or twist. And this usually takes about two to four weeks, depending on the size of the library. Afterwards, you want to PCR amplify the oligos, um, restriction digest the backbone, and then insert the um, oligos with um, PCR amplified product with um, Gibson assembly and then do isopropanol precipitation before um, introducing the pool of, uh, pool of Gibson reaction. And it's very important throughout this process to maintain representation of your screen by scaling up accordingly. Um, and we have a table for how to scale up um, based on how many guides are in your library in the protocol. And next, um, it's very, also very important to verify your sgRNA distribution by NGS before starting the screen, because the screen is a very long, um, arduous process. Um, and so you want to make sure that your library is actually good going into the screen. And so just in case anything goes wrong later, you know um, you can avoid that. Um, so we recommend for NGS analysis of sgRNA distribution to do a one-round PCR because it, this is cleaner and it's much easier. And so we have provided very long um, one-round NGS primers for doing this. And after sequencing on the MySeq, um, you can determine the guide distribution by counting the number of times do you see a read with a particular guide target sequence. And we also provide scripts for doing this. And Generally, we recommend that you proceed if, oh, if over 70% of the library has perfectly matching guides, so meaning the um, target sequence is exactly matching one of the target sequences in your library, and um, less than 0.5% are undetected, as, and the skew ratio of your library is less than 10. This refers to the top 10% versus the top uh, the top 90% of the guides, and see how, how the count vary between the top 10% and the bottom 10%. And so next is the lentivirus production. For this part, we, we usually for screening, we recommend using a lentiviral delivery because most screens are either positive and negative selection, which means that the cell, num you're dependent on the cell growth or death. And the lentiviral delivery is ideal because it integrates in the genome and has a very large capacity. So it allows us to do, have vectors that are um, a single vector with the Cas9 and the guide on the same vector. And um, the, for, for, the, for the protocol, we have a, two different methods of producing lentivirus. The lipomphectomy protocol, which is a bit more ex expensive but a bit more established, as well as using PEI, which is very, very cheap and um, can also be used for making lentivirus. And uh, for non-dividing cells like neurons, AV can also be used. Um, but all of our libraries right now are in lentiviral backbone, so you'll have to clone your own um, if you really want to use AAV with a fluorophore, for example. So the next step is the transduction and selection of your sgRNA library. Um, so for 
lentivirus titer to determine how much lentivirus you need to use in your screen in, in order to achieve a perturbation such that one cell only um, has, is most likely to have a one per perturbation. So to do this, we will um, do a test transduction, usually either by spinfecting or mixing, um, and this depends on the cell type. And so what we'll do is we'll um, transduce with different amounts of lentivirus and then determine the multiplicity of infection for the screening transduction. So the multiplic no, multiplicity of infection, or MOI, is after you infect the cells with a certain amount of virus, what is the fraction of the cells surviving a selection versus the cells that, that um, just did not have the selection? And um, you'll scale up the screen according to this number. And I'll talk about which MOI we usually transduce that in a minute. But to scale up the transduction, usually, so for typically for a library of 100,000 sgRNAs, if we want a coverage of 500 cells per sgRNA in the library, and we're transducing at an MOI of 0.3, that means that we'll need 167 million cells to start out with. And during the screen, for if we want to keep maintaining a coverage of 500 cells per sgRNA, which is recommended, um, we'll, we'll re need about 50 million cells. So now um, you can see why performing a targeted screen sometimes might be useful for sensitive cell types or primary cells. Now, for knockout screening, um, first, if you're doing a two-vector system, there's an optional step of transducing the Cas9 vector, at usually at an MOI of less than 0.7, because we don't care that much if one cell has two different copies of Cas9, or just one. And for the guide library, we recommend transducing an MOI of um, less than 0.3, usually 0.2 to 0.3. And so this tries to get at a single perturbation per cell. And then, for knockout screening, usually the number of indels saturates at seven days. So we recommend starting the screen seven days after the library transduction. And, and throughout, and of course for, for the transduction, we recommend ha having a represented, re representation of over 500 cells per guide. And typically we do four bioreps. Um, um, you can do anywhere from two to four bioreps, but it's very important to have bioreps. Um, because this will enable the screening analysis and let, let you sift through the, the noise in the, each screen. And for transcriptional activation, um, we transduce the activator component similarly at an MOI of 0.7, and then we transduce the guide library at an MOI of less than 0.3. For activation, because we, we see very robust activation um, like a day or two after transducing the guide, um, we can start as early as two days after um, library transduction, but because there's usually a selection period for the screen, um, we recommend total starting a screen four days after library transduction, unless your selection is very, very quick, and you can start after two days. <clears throat> and again, we rep maintain representation of 500 cells per guide during this process. So throughout the screen, there are several considerations that are very important. Um, first, the screening parameters. Yes? Oh, so you want me to go slower? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can go a bit slower. Um, okay, so um, the considerations of screening. Um, it's a very important to choose screening parameters that really optimize um, selecting for cells that, with the phenotype that you want versus cells that you don't want. So um, usually for new screens, we recommend um, trying to determine, for example, the optimal drug dosage by figuring out um, with a positive or negative control that we know from literature. And of course, the, these things are a little bit nebulous, so sometimes you may have to just do the screen, collect multiple time points, and see um, which time point do you get the most difference between the, your experimental and control conditions. And again, maintaining a coverage of over 500 cells per guide at least is very important. And then <clears throat> it's also important to remain very consistent throughout the screen because the, um, like if you change any small thing, like you s somehow switch media in, in the middle of your screen, you don't know if the, at the end of your screen, the difference that you see is due to the media change or like the, um, 
or something from the screen. So you, you might get some um, false positives from that. And so then, then the next step is to harvest and analyze the screen. At the end of the screen, you're going to have two different populations of cells, your experimental and your control conditions. Um, for um, drug selection, it's typically um, plus or minus drug. For facts, it's the cells with the, that you've sorted for that are the most fluorescent versus the cells that are the least fluorescent. And <clears throat> so from these two different populations of cells, you isolate the gDNA. The details for how to isolate the gDNA and amplify for um, NGS analysis in, is in the protocol. Um, we ha we've provided a very large scale way to um, amplify the uh, genomic DNA and amplify all the guides from the pool without introducing much, uh, too much bias. So once we have the NGS data and the count distributions for these guides, um, I'll first go over the rigor analysis. This is the one that we did for the Gecko and SAM papers. Um, there's also um, new protocols for how to do this, like MAGIC and um, STAR, that might be worth looking at. But traditionally, we've, um, but the overall theory is very similar between the, the three different methods. So first, we typically normalize the experimental guide counts to the control for each guide. So for each guide, you'll have a ratio of how much it was enriched versus depleted. And then we rank guides in the order of enrichment or depletion, depending on the, your type of screen and what you're looking for. And then for each gene, we'll look at where its guides are in the distribution and um, see if uh, the, the distribution, the ranking of the distribution, uh, is significant. So for example, if I, if I have uh, 10 different guides and for one gene I have a guide that's ranked one, two, and uh, four, then it is more likely to be significant because all three guides targeting that same gene has been enriched. And this type of um, analysis takes into account things like um, different off-target effects, potential off-target effects for each guide, because you're unlikely, it's very unlikely that all three guides will have the same off-target that resulted in your phenotype. So if you see that all three guides are enriched for a particular gene, then it's likely that the gene itself and the perturbation of that gene was causing your phenotype. And from <clears throat> and from this kind of analysis, we obtain a um, candidate gene list, so a ranked list of genes that um, are potentially um, involved in the phenotype of interest. Okay, and the final step is validation. Again, the validation step is just as important as the screen itself because you get at the end of the screen uh, a, a ranked list of genes and you don't know which ones are actually significant. So for validation, we will do an arrayed validation. So what this means is that we're going to repeat the first part of the screen again, except this time we will make, instead of making a big batch of lentivirus that, with a, that, pack, that have a pool of guide RNA virus, um, we will take each of the top um, SG, enriched sgRNAs that correspond to each top hit and then um, produce lentivirus individually in, in a much smaller, at a much smaller scale. And then we will trans, also transduce these guys individually into the same cell population and verify, verify um, knockout and activation. So um, for knockout, we will extract the gDNA from the validation cell line. Um, do, in this case, we recommend a two round PCR for um, of the target site with alumina adapters. The reason why we do this is usually, say you have uh, 10, 10 or 10 to 20 um, target genes that you want to go after. This, you, this corresponds to about 30 to 60 different guides. And when you're trying to do that, you want, you have uh, many, many different conditions. So in this case, you want to do a two round PCR because it allows you more flexibility. And you, um, after amplifying the target sequences of these guides, you can attach different barcodes. So there's, there's much more flexibility because you can adjust the second round of primers to whatever barcodes you want to attach for the um, particular amplicon. And for these amplicons, you want to do NGS analysis and figure out whether or not there was an indel that corresponded to the phenotype of interest. And of course, it's also very important to do Western blot to verify the protein that 
was actually knocked down due to this indel mutation. And so for validation of transcriptional activation, it's very, very similar, except you want to um, isolate the RNA and then do a qPCR to verify that the, there was gene upregulation or in this case, or for transcriptional knockdown, you want to do a qPCR to determine, trans, uh, uh, verify the knockdown. So for this part, we, we have a homebrew protocol for rapid extraction and RT. Um, and this protocol is super cheap. It's very, very similar to cells to CT for those of you who have used cells to CT, um, except it's like 5% uh, of the price or 1% of the price. And so th the entire setup going from a plate of cells to an RT reaction takes me about half an hour for a 96 well plate. So it's much faster than the previous method of um, isolating by columns, and I strongly recommend looking at this protocol if you're doing RT-QPCR. Um, okay, so now going over uh, the first practical example of um, setting up a VEMRAFINIF screen. For the VEMRAFINIF screen, um, gain of function screen, we targeted our library to um, all the transcriptional star sites of rest -seek isoforms um, to activate the each isoform in a genome scale gain of function library. We transduce this library into sgRNAs, um, and we've synthesized the sgRNAs and produced antivirus from this pool and transduce it into DRAF D600E melanoma cells. These are mel melanoma cells that have a mutation in BRAF that allows them to proliferate. And um, this particular uh, mutant is very sensitive to verbrinafinib. Verbrinafinib um, is very effective to block the growth of these cells. The problem with verbrinafinib is that the resistance quickly develops and in two weeks, as quickly as two weeks after we treat with BRAF inhibitor or control, you can see the resistance cells with the perturbations that confer the resistance grow more quickly and um, these cells will be more enriched in the, in the final population. So this is a positive selection screen. And at the end of the screen, we want to compare the change in counts of sgRNAs to determine which, which sgRNAs were enriched versus depleted in the screen. And so as an example of our screening results, um, if we take a scatter plot of the different um, sgRNA guide counts, at the beginning of the screen, it's like pretty, pretty consistent. Um, after, after the screen for the control condition, there are some um, sgRNAs that have been depleted or enriched based on whether or not they affected the growth of the cell independently of the venorafinib treatment. And then um, after venorafinib treatment um, with a particular venorafinib um, PLX, there is a much more enrichment or depletion of sgRNA guide counts. So we know that there, some of these guides up here will probably correspond to the phenotype. And if we look at the rigor analysis of these guides, um, for the top hits, the guide positions are generally, if we look at the um, sgRNA frequency from the PLX treatment versus the control, all, all of the, all three of the guides that target the top hits will be a much more enriched in the S, uh, PLX condition versus the DMSO condition. And um, compared to the rigor p-values, these particular hits will have much lower p-values compared to all the other genes. And so this is example data from a screen that we've done before. Now, more recently, um, Charlie from the Lander Lab has done a, a very interesting non-coding screen, and he is going to present on how they went about setting that screen up. Hi. Uh, as she said, I'm uh, Charlie, and I'll tell you about efforts in the Lander Lab to associate enhancers and the genes they regulate in a high throughput fashion. And the core problem is that for any given gene, which of course, uh, which of course we know uh, the gene sequences, we know where the genes are, we don't know the set of regulatory elements that regulate that gene, uh, even if we know where those regulatory elements are based on ENCODE data, and here I'm schematicizing those in red. And so we'd like to be able to draw the links from red balls to the blue promoters. And the challenge is that any given enhancer can be regulated by many, many genes, uh, sorry, any, many gene 
It can be regulated by a single enhancer. Uh, a gene can be regulated by multiple enhancers, and these enhancers can act over very long genomic distances, and so the space of possible interactions is very large. And so in applying this to a specific locus, the MYC locus, here MYC, the MYC gene sits here, and this is about three megabases of the MYC topological domain, uh, this region has 93 DHS elements, um, op regions of open chromatin, and there are 185 kilobases in this region annotated by ENCODE to be strong enhancer. And so what we need to do if we want to understand the cis regulation of MYC is to go in and disrupt each of these putative regulatory elements one by one and measure their effect on MYC expression. And this would be very challenging to do in a arrayed setting. This would be quite a lot of wells in a 96 well plate, quite a, little, about a lot of time uh, for me. And so we are using uh, a pooled screening approach. And so in contrast to the cutting uh, loss of function screens uh, that Julia talked about or the activation screens, we're using a uh, CRAB DCAS9 CRISPR-I system where uh, we've fused a catalytically dead Cas9 to a CRAB domain. And CRAB is known uh, in literature to re recruit histone deacetylases and methylases to shut down active regions. And so we can recruit CRAB to the regions around a gene of interest, in this case MYC, uh, and so we're targeting effectively every place we can put a guide around MYC. And uh, with MYC, we can use a little bit of a trick. MYC is uh, both highly essential and has no essential neighbors, and so we can use growth as a phenotype to select for regions that uh, that whose inhibition leads to MYC reduction and therefore to cell death. And so this would be a negative selection uh, loss of function screen. And so now if we, and uh, the screening uh, protocol is effectively the same as what uh, Julia presented uh, with uh, infecting cells at low MOI, growing them and comparing before uh, selection and after selection and looking for guide RNAs that are depleted. If we zoom in on the MYC gene itself uh, here, this is about 20 KB shown, and um, we plot the score of each individual guide RNA, uh, there are a few things to note. Uh, so here I'm showing the depletion going up of each guide RNA. We would interpret this as, uh, each dot is here as a guide RNA, and we would interpret higher as more depleted and therefore more likely to regulate MYC expression. Uh, you notice quite a bit of variability in the scores of the guide RNAs. Uh, one source of this is simply screening noise. Another is that guide RNAs differ in their intrinsic ability to recruit Cas9 and to, uh, uh, and to affect a phenotype. And so we uh, average across 20 adjacent guides to produce a sort of element level score at every 20 guide window, and this is analogous to what Julie was talking about of how when you like to see multiple guides targeting the same gene all enriched in the screen or depleted in the screen. And so here we've simply averaged 20 adjacent guides and created a CRISPR I score, and we can see um, discrete peaks of scoring, and we've compared the scores in each of these 20 guide windows to non, um, to both non-targeting guide RNAs as well as guide RNAs that target regions far from any essential genes that we expect not to score in a proliferation screen and use this to call uh, peaks. And importantly, the MYC TSS and promoter itself are one peak, this would be a positive control, as well as a previously described MYC enhancer just upstream. So we have confidence that this um, metric is giving us meaningful uh, MYC regulatory elements. Uh, if we zoom out onto the entire three megabase MYC region, and now I'm showing only the 20 guide uh, windows um, to resolve, we see you know, clearly the MYC locus itself regulates MYC, as you'd expect, as well as seven distal enhancers um, up to over a megabase away from MYC that we assign um, to be regulating MYC uh, in this cell type. And here is simply a summary of these data um, using the rank of, the, of each of these 20 guide elements as well as the, the scoring elements and for comparison what that negative control non-essential region in the genome looks like. 
Um, I don't have time to tell you about all of the um, validation that we did, but we used single guide RNAs, validated that MYC uh, transcription is reduced, as well as having an effect on proliferation. Um, each of these elements looks like uh, an enhancer. It's marked by ENCODE as an enhancer. It's in open chromatin, it's conserved. And we also were able to get deletions for a subset of these elements, and those deletions cause a reduction in MYC expression. Um, and so uh, in conclusion, uh, we found that CRISPR-I uh, CRISPR screening can be scalable in that we were able to simultaneously assay the regulatory functions of well over a megabase of genomic sequence. Uh, this is general in that while we used growth as a phenotype, you can imagine gain or loss of function gene tagged experiments uh, to assay the regulation of an arbitrary gene. Uh, and importantly, it is both sensitive and quantitative. This averaging across several adjacent guides um, normalizes out effects of, say, a single guide that doesn't work or perhaps has a off target that we don't want, and it makes the estimate of how much a given element regulates MYC quantitative because we're not trusting any single potentially noisy uh, measure of a guide RNA. We're averaging across, in this case, 20 guide RNAs. And to point out a, a potential issue that um, people you might be interested in if you're doing these sorts of non-coding screens is to whether to use a CRAB DCAS9 inhibition tool or active Cas9 that actually cuts the locus. And in these screens, also published by uh, Fung's lab, they're using a single guide RNA to cut uh, in, a, in a pooled fashion to tile every guide RNA in a region and then find those that are enriched or depleted and see that the cut right at a motif uh, imparts a function. And so these two screens are both potentially very useful, but I'll point out a trade-off uh, between these two strategies, and one is that CRISPR-I screening, because you get many adjacent guides that all affect the same element, it can be both sensitive and quantitative. Uh, however, you have multiple adjacent guides affecting the same elements. You're thinking in terms of element level. Is this enhancer relevant for MYC? Whereas cutting screens have the potential to get um, deeper into individual motif level scores, though those measurements tend to be noisier and less quantitative because you're relying on the action of a single guide RNA. And so um, I also don't have time to tell you um, how we've taken these data at the MYC locus and synthesized them into a predictive model for uh, enhancer promoter connectivity that is able to predict um, fairly well the results from our uh, screen based on uh, 3D confirmation of the genome from high C data, as well as ChIP-seq and DHS scores uh, that are relatively easily uh, obtainable for a variety of cell types or may already exist. And we've applied these, this metric to other cell types, and I've been able to identify, previously identified enhancers in other cell types as predicted to be highly regulating uh, MYC in that context. And so we expect that this model could uh, enable understanding of enhancers in places where these sorts of large-scale experiments are not possible. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank um, all the people that helped uh, in the Lander Lab, especially Jesse, who um, was a big part of all this research but lost the coin toss to present to you today, and uh, as well as uh, our friends and collaborators in other labs. And then with that, I'll hand it back to, uh, to Julia. And for, for my stuff, I'd like to thank um, all the people who helped out with developing the protocol and of course the rest of the panel. And now I'll take questions. So thank you, Julia and Charlie. Um, we'll do about like 10 or 15 minutes of questions. So if you guys have specific questions, if you want to um, set up screens in your own for your own um, work, we are here to answer questions about screens. And then at 11:35, um, we will start the final module where we'll, we will discuss um, in vivo editing. Um, Surav is going to talk about using AAV, um, and then we'll talk about RNA targeting enzymes and specificity. Okay.